I'm really thrilled to be able to uh, be in Revelation chapter 4. So if you'll turn there with me. Very quickly, I will uh, bring you up to uh, where we are in our study together. <coughs> Revelation chapter 1 helps us to understand that the book of Revelation is not, is not a, a revelation of prophecy, even though it is. It's not a revelation of things to come, even though it is. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. We have to understand that. And it is very important for us to understand to look for Jesus. I appreciated, Ron, your, your song. James and Barbara, so nice to see you guys this morning. And uh, she brought me a birthday cake, a little, little late or a little early, however you want to look at it. And uh, that's always nice. Um, this COVID thing has really screwed up our life, isn't it? Roman, good to see you and others. Danny, good to see you and, and just so many, so many others. In fact, it's really kind of good to just see anybody. Uh, but, <laughs> but chapter one deals totally with John's vision of Jesus. And it sets the tone for the entire book of Revelation. In fact, it's the only book of the Bible that says, um, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and, they, and, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So there's, there's a blessing, a blessing, for those that read the book of Revelation. You say, well, I don't understand it all. It doesn't matter. It's a blessing. God gives us a blessing for that. And then secondly, there's a blessing for those that hear the reading and the teaching of the book of Revelation. It doesn't say that about any other book of the Bible. And yet it's the most shunned book of the Bible. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because... Uh, ye old uh, horned one, <laughs> Satan, Beelzebub, the devil, wants to keep us out of this book because it's his demise. Amen. Okay? And it is also a blessing for those who keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So, that's where we start out. We, we, we get to see uh, his, his uh, vision of Jesus, and that sets the stage for the rest of the book. Okay. So if someone says, uh, what's the book of Revelation about? You know what you can say? Jesus. That's all you have to say is Jesus. It's about Jesus. And so that's the first thing. The, the se second chapter and the third chapter are about the seven churches of Revelation. And we found that Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, to John, who was the transcriber, wrote messages to all seven churches. Now, and I know we separate today our, our churches by... by um, uh, Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterian and Roman Catholic and, and uh, Episcopal and, and, and every other variety that you want. But really, in all of the church age, which started at the time that Jesus uh, went back to heaven and ends at the time Jesus comes back for those that trusted Christ in this period of time from his leaving to his coming back again. 
in the church age, there are only seven kinds of church. Wipe away Baptist, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be a Baptist, you understand. And that's why we have Baptist on our name. Why, why do we do that? Well, because I want people to know kind of what they're going to get if they come inside. Amen. Okay? Kind of. <laughs> Hopefully they'll find something a little different than some Baptists here in our church. Like friendliness and kindness and love and patience, long-suffering, those type of things. But he wrote letters to these churches, to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Smyrna, to the church at Pergamos, to the church at Thyatira, to the church at Sardis, to the church at Philadelphia, and finally the church of Laodicea. And we've studied those. Over the months we've studied those. And God had a message to each one of those churches. Now, most Bible teachers believe that we are living in this last age of Laodicea. The lukewarm church. And it is the last church and God gave us indicators of what that church was going to be like their hotness was going to become lukewarm their coldness was going to become lukewarm and he laid out for us that age in which things would deteriorate to the point where Satan could take over. You do understand that, right? Amen. I mean, you know, in one sense we want the Lord to come, in the other sense we don't want things to be bad. Well, Amen. you can't have both. Amen. I mean, you can't have, yeah, you can't, well, it's going to be both. I mean, you know, the Lord's going to come, and but things are going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. The Bible tell, tells us that. Amen. And so, we have that in, ver in chapter 4. Now, I mean in chapter 3. 2 and 3, the seven churches. If God, if God went through the, the city of Rowlett or the city of Dallas or Rockwall or wherever, Garland, he would, he would change the names of the churches to one of these seven churches. I hope that he'd put on the, our door the church of the open door. It'd be a terrible to be a Laodicean church, wouldn't it? Amen. Or any of the other churches. And so that's where we are right now. We are right at the end, <clears throat> it, here in the Word, we're right at the end of the church age. Now when does the church age end? It simply ends when Jesus comes, what we call the rapture. Now the word rapture is not in the Bible. You can't look, at, you can't look it up on your concordance. It's not there. You can use the calling up. You can call the, trans, the, the transportation of God's people to heaven. Um, and, uh, but that's where we are at, in our study. Now, when we get to chapter 4, and I'm not going to read the whole chapter this morning because I want to cover some ground, and I'm literal today, I could preach till tonight on this one wonderful chapter of the Bible. But let's start with verse 1. And John is, John is writing, in fact, in fact, I've entitled this, this chapter, What John Experienced. What John experienced. Now, there, as far as I know, there are only, to this point, uh, as far as living people are concerned, there are only four people that experienced heaven in the flesh. Okay? Now, not counting Jesus, okay? The first one was Enoch. 
Remember? He walked with God and God took him. Uh, they walked together every day, Enoch, and God did. Isn't that amazing? God not only walked with, with Adam and Eve, he walked with Enoch. And they'd go out for a stroll and they'd, uh, they would talk. They had great fellowship with each other. And, um, and I know a little bit about that because when I was going to Bob Jones University, which is, it was a pretty tight-knit school, and, uh, and on Saturday, my best friend, uh, his name is Jim, Jim Ruskowski, Jim and I, would, we'd leave campus and we'd walk through the neighborhoods and uh, just, just walked and talked and, and uh, had great fellowship with each other and enjoyed the beautiful weather and so forth of South Carolina. And, and man, that was a magnificent time. And it was a magnificent time for Adam and Eve. And it was a great time for Enoch. And oftentimes God would say, Enoch, well, okay, we're done with our walk. I'll see you later. See you tomorrow. See you next week. Whatever it was. And one day they walked and they walked and they walked a little bit longer than they did. And God just said to Enoch, he said, you know, Enoch, we're a little closer to my house than your house. Why don't you come home with me? And he was not, for God took him. Amen. The next one was Elijah. Remember? Elijah and Elisha were there, and, and uh, Elijah gave Elisha his mantle, and along came the fiery chariot out of heaven, and swooped down and picked up Elijah and took him on into heaven. A live person. Amen. Now you say, well, what, uh, shouldn't, they, shouldn't they die? Yeah, they will. And we'll study that when they die in the book of Revelation. But they're still alive now, and they still have earthly bodies in heaven. That's amazing, isn't it? Then the third person was Paul. Paul. Because he, he went to heaven, he saw things, and he came back and said, I can't say anything. I can't tell you about it. And the last person was John the Apostle. Now this is the young man who loved Jesus. As much as anybody loved Jesus. And uh, when they talked about betrayal, he was the first one to say, Lord, is it I? You're my best friend. How could I, could I possibly do that? It almost breaks your heart when you think about it, doesn't it? John, who was boiled in oil and yet lived. Much of his flesh just fell off of him. And he was so ugly and so awful to look at, they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos and dropped him off. And I'm sure he wondered, boy, man, that's a tough journey. But Jesus said, I've got something special for you. He said, I'm going to let you write the book of prophecy, the book about me and the things to come. So those four people went to heaven, and each one said, I, in the Spirit or not in the Spirit, I, I don't know. Okay? Those four. Enoch, Elijah, Paul, and John. And so here's John's recollection because God allowed John to tell his story. He took pictures, folks, and he wrote about it when he got back. And he said exactly what he saw when he went to heaven. And I think that's a great place to start this morning. Amen. First number one point is his airlift to heaven. And he said, after this, after what? And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. 
In, John, in Revelation chapter 4, in verse 1, we have, we have left the Isle of Patmos and the vision of Jesus. We have left the church age, okay? And now we're interest, entering, entering into an era that no one has ever been before. It's an age of prophecy. It's the age of what Jesus is going to do both in heaven and on the earth. It's, it's about our future, either in heaven or in hell. It's our future. And we're going to get a very clear-cut understanding and picture that John's going to give us. Paul couldn't do it. He was told you can't do it. You just can't, you can't talk about it. John was told, I want you to write what you see. So let's look at this. It says, after I, this, I looked. So after what? Basically, it is after the church age is closed. Do you understand that all that God is, is waiting for? There's two things that God's waiting for. Number one, or what Jesus is waiting for, is God saying to his son, son, it is now time. You see, uh, they ask, well, when, when are you coming? He said, I don't know. He said, no man knows, only my father, which is in heaven. I can't tell you when I'm coming back. I can't tell you the end of the age. I can't tell you when the church age ends. However, my father knows and when, when it happens and when it's time, he will tell me. Okay? Secondly, there is going to be one last person that gets saved that will close out the church. Will it be in America? I don't know. Will it be in Korea? I don't know. Will it, will it be in the Philippines? I don't know. Will it be in America? I don't know. Will it be in the Dominican Republic? I don't know. Will it be in our church? Could be. Could be. The last person to get saved in the church age could be sitting here today. And then the Lord's going to come. So those two events, and, and Jesus doesn't know that. God knows it. And that will be the start of this whole thing. And so after this, after what? After the church age is finished. The last person who's going to get saved in the Laodicean era of the church age, which lasts from Jesus leaving to Jesus coming, will then that triggers what happens. Now, I could have preached why I believe that Jesus is coming soon. But that doesn't deal with the rapture. That deals with the second coming of the Lord. Okay, you follow what I'm saying? Amen. Because all the signs concerning Jesus coming are concerning the second coming. Yes. Not the rapture. There is, because that's why the apostles thought Jesus was going to come in their time. Because there was nothing that had to happen for Jesus to come back again. This same Jesus which is taken from you uh, will so come in like manner as others have seen him as you've seen him go. Okay? Jesus could come at any time. All right? But we're there. Okay, and it says, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. A door was opened in heaven. Now that's, what door? What door? Okay, well, let's, let's, let's look at a couple things. In John chapter 10 and verse 7, it says this. Then Jesus said unto them again, verily, verily, or amen, amen. We looked at that, right? Amen, amen, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. So we're already seeing in chapter 4 and verse 1, this is about Jesus. 
I am the door. The second verse is found in John 10, 9. It says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. I want you to get that. If any man enter in to salvation, it comes through Jesus. Not the church, not the denomination, not the baptismal waters, not the pastor, not your, your parents, Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have everything. If you don't have Jesus, as far as eternity is concerned, you have nothing. Nothing. If you don't have Jesus, you've lost it all. Then in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, which we just finished up, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. In other words, Jesus is the door into what? Salvation? And into heaven. Okay? He's the door. Now, what trumpet? What trumpet? These are good questions, aren't they? Now, here's what the Lord said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Now, now this happens so fast. It happens so fast that the Bible says it happens in the twinkling of an eye. Not the batting of an eye, but the twinkling of an eye. It's like when a little child sees all the presents at Christmas, that instantaneous twinkle. That fast. And what will happen first is all the dead that have died in Jesus Christ from the early days to the last person that gets saved, they die in the Lord. Not the last person gets saved, but the last person saved that dies will be resurrected. Okay? Resurrected. That's, that's the first resurrection. There are two resurrections. The first resurrection is for the saved. The second resurrected is for the lost. For the lost. Those that do not know Jesus Christ will be resurrected to stand before the Lord. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. The first resurrection is, is a, a, a resurrection of the saved and it is for the purpose of judging their rewards. The second judgment, uh, the second re, uh, res, uh, resurrection is for the resurrection of the lost, and it's for the judgment of their sin. You say, well, what about our sin? What sin? If you're saved, you have no sin. Amen. It's been forgiven. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm kind of like, like that. You know, the, the burden of sin, the guilt of sin, is one of the heaviest burdens we will ever carry in our lives. And if we can just grab through our minds that when we confess and forsake our sin, our sin has been forgiven and taken from us, and God lays out for us his righteousness. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? But this is the first resurrection. And first of all, the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
I said one time, man, I'd love to be in a cemetery if the Lord comes, if it's not in the night. <laughs> they have to think about that a little bit. <laughs> but man, it'd be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it, to see all these graves open up? And the second thing, those of us that are alive on the earth, we won't be resurrected because it's the body that's resurrected. But we'll be changed. The same resurrection that the lost get and their, their decayed bodies will get a new body. We'll be changed into a new body on our way to heaven. You with me? And so we will be in, we'll get there at the same time, but we have a six foot head start, so the Lord's going to take care of those that have died first. And so we're, we're in a rise to meet the Lord in the air, and then he's going to take us back to heaven. Okay? So here's John. He said, after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and first of the voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me. That's describing what he, what he heard here. He's describing the rapture of the church. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And at that moment, we'll never be out of God's presence. That's a pretty good deal, isn't it? Now, the, the, third, the fourth question is this. Who says, come up hither? Well, I think that's a, a really good question because I'm not sure if that's the Lord Jesus or if that's God the Father. You know, uh, God the Father may be the one that calls the Holy Spirit home. Now, and I, I, wanna, I want you to grab a hold of this. He may send his, send his Son to get us, but He may be the one that calls the Holy Spirit home. Now, what does that mean? I believe, I believe that when a person gets saved, you see, you, you and me, we don't do anything except receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. That's all we do. We just receive it. We, we don't do anything. All we do is receive the gift. But we, we don't have anything to do with the gift. What's the gift? Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, his blood covering us from our sin to our righteousness. But at the same moment, something happens, and that is the Holy Spirit comes inside us. That's the, that's the evidence of the church age. Up until the church age, understand, the Holy Spirit came upon people. All through the Old Testament, all through the Gospels, the Holy Spirit came upon people. But Jesus said, he's not going to do that anymore in the church age. He's going to come inside of you. He's going to come inside of you. And he is responsible for my and your resurrection if we're saved. What causes someone that has been dead for 2,000 years to their body to be resurrected? The Holy Spirit. I believe because it says that the Holy Spirit is God's down payment to us for our salvation. Now, what does that mean? Anybody, anybody may ever make a down payment on a house? I think some of us have. It means, will you hold what I'm going to get for me? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you incentive to hold that for me. I'm going to give you $5,000, $10,000, whatever it is. I'm going to give you that. And if I don't come back to get that, I lose it. 
Okay? Now, in the Bible, it calls it earnest. And we know what earnest money is. It's a down payment. And so when I got saved, God deposited in me the Holy Spirit, which was the down payment of my salvation. If the Lord did not come back for me, he would forfeit the Holy Spirit, which we know is impossible. Every person that's gotten saved has gotten the Holy Spirit. And again, he's God. He can be everywhere at once. I believe the Holy Spirit rests with the decayed bodies of those who have died from the very first people that got saved under the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. And they're waiting there. The Holy Spirit is waiting there. He's the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, the Father is going to say, come up hither. Who's he talking to? The dead? No, he's talking to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit says, well, here, let me collect a few things. <laughs> And, and whether it's dust or whether it's bones or whether it's flesh, and all of a sudden, it goes. And it's on the way up. And in and, and that twinkling of an eye, in that split second, when they get to our level, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, man, I want to, you know, in me, he says, I'm going with the, the other, the Holy Spirit from everybody else. And he catches us up. Now, I, I, I'll be real honest with you. I've tried, but I can't fly. <laughs> now, I'll be honest with you, and my brother never told me if I put a cape on, got on top of the house, I'd, I could fly. I'd never had that experience. But I thought it'd be neat to fly when I was a kid. But I can't fly. And by the way, I can jump up and down. Well, I could have jumped and down at one point, up and down. And you know what? I'm not going to get up anywhere. The only thing that's going to take me up is the Holy Spirit. Amen. The only one that's going to take you up is the Holy Spirit. And by the way, that's why you can't mess around with your salvation. Amen. You know, you could be here this morning and be lost. Not have the Holy Spirit and tell me all day long you're saved. But you know what? When the rapture takes place, you're going to stay and I'm going to go. You know, when, when we try to convince people we're saved and we're really not saved, you know what? The only one we're confusing is ourselves. Amen. The only one we're fooling is ourselves. The only one that we're gonna, that's going to lose is us. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we which are alive and remain because of the Holy Spirit are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then the Lord's going to take us back to heaven. And so shall we ever be with him. And so who says come up hither? I think, it's, I think personally it is God the Father. They are his children, right? We're brothers and sisters with Jesus. But we are the children of God. And he's going to call the Holy Spirit and bring the family home. That's an exciting thing. Amen. Now... Talking with me says, come up hither and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. What things? The things that are going to happen in heaven and on earth. The door has been opened. John has been given permission to come through the door. And he's going to see things in heaven but he's also going to be told things that are going to happen on the earth. And it says what things must be hereafter. What does that mean? Must be hereafter. It means these things are going to happen. Must be. Not, not kind of might be. Sort of might be but are going to happen. Uh, there's going to be a whole different dynamic when God takes over completely than when governments takes over. Amen. I mean, government can lie to us all day long with a straight face. 
But when God says these things must be, you can bet your bottom dollar on it. Amen. No fooling here. And if you're a child of God and you want to know what's going to happen, hang on to your seat. Yes. Now, I'm going to read the next two verses, but I can't go on because I can't finish it. And I'll pick it up first thing next Sunday morning. But in verses 2 and 3, it says this. And immediately I was in the Spirit. I was in the Spirit. Okay? And so John has been taken to heaven and he's now in the Spirit. Okay? And he's able to travel and he's able to see things. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sardis stone, sardin stone. And there was a rainbow around about the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. When we, when we get into this, we're going to find out what the throne of God looks like. I don't know what you've imagined, but I have a, I have a pretty good imagination. I'm, I'm a visual person. And because I, I like to see what I'm reading about. I want, to see, I want to see it. And so I don't know if you, you see a throne like is in the, th the throne room in England where the queen sits, or one of the other thrones that some of the kings and sit on or the queens sit on around the world. Uh, you may have watched, uh, what, what, what was that movie, the th something of thrones? Game of the Game of Thrones. And, uh, and I know it had a lot of knives and, and spears and so forth sticking out of it. And uh, you may think it looks like that. But the Bible's going to tell us what it looks like. And it's going to have some implica implications that are more than just what we read here. There's some depth here. And we're going to know exactly what the throne looks like. We're going to know exactly who's sitting on that throne. And we're going to know who is surrounding the throne. And uh, there are going to be 24 chairs around the throne. And there's going to be four, what the Bible calls, beasts. Now, what does a beast look like? I, I don't know. I haven't seen a heavenly beast before. <coughs> but one's going to have the face of a man. One's going to have a, the face of a, um, let's see, what do we have here? Um, a lion. One's going to have the face of a calf or an ox. And one's going to have the face of a flying eagle. I don't know, I've never seen a beast like that. And so, but we're going we're gonna to be introduced to that, and we're going to see exactly what that means. And in fact, each one of those beasts have six different wings. Not just one set of wings, but six wings. And, uh, and the Bible's going to tell us what they do, and why they do it, and what our part of it is. And I'd love to get into that, and, uh, but my time is swip, swiftly leaving. But let me just say this. These things must be. These things must take place. 
You, you can call heaven a fantasy if you want to. But to me, heaven is as real as Chicago, Illinois. As real as London, England. You say, well, I've never been to London. I don't know if that's there or not. Okay. Well, I've never been to heaven, but I guarantee I have more faith in heaven being there than I do London, England being there. <laughs> and the fact is, what's going to take place in the book of Revelation is exactly what God's telling us is the going to take place. This is, not, this is not something that we can take or leave. This is something we've got to face in all reality. Because it all boils down to what we do with Jesus. If we trust Jesus as our personal Savior to forgive our sins, to cleanse us and make us righteous in His sight, we will inherit heaven. If we say, oh, come on, you got to be kidding me. That Jesus stuff, baloney. Just throw it away. Just throw it away. But I'm going to tell you, if you don't ever get saved, one of these days you're going to die and you're going to go to hell forever. Forever. And that's a whole different sermon, but I want to tell you, it's not as... Is nice is what heaven's going to be. And the fact is, we, we have to be really serious about this stuff because a hundred years from now, we everyone in this room will either be in heaven or hell. I don't know about you. But many of us have had surgery. And when Ruthie and I prayed before I went into surgery last Friday, not this Friday, but a week ago Friday, I, neither, neither, I, either, I knew that I would either go home or that I'd be home. That's a wonderful promise. And it has nothing to do with what I am or who I am. It has everything to do with Jesus. Jesus, plus nothing, minus nothing, makes heaven a reality. Isn't that a great thing? Let me give you one illustration and I'll be done. I hate to finish early. <laughs> a man in England, speaking of England, a man in England dressed very commonly, even though he was very rich. And he found a he found a little urchin, a little street kid, dirty, hungry, cold. And he said, young man, how would you like a home? How would you like a family? He said, well, sir, I don't have a family. He said, but you can have a family. And he said, I'm going to write down an address for you. And I want you to go there, and I want you, whatever you ask, I just want you to say, Jesus. That's all I want you to say. If you'd like a family, because you don't have a family, I want you to go to this address. And no matter what the question is, I want you to answer Jesus. And the little boy could read and 
and he found the street and he went to the house and it was a mansion. And he went and he knocked on the door and the butler came to the door. And he said, uh, young man, would you like to come in? He said, Jesus will come on in. He said, young man, how would you like, how would you like to uh, get cleaned up? He said, Jesus. And they took him in and the maids cleaned him up, got him a nice warm bath and put warm bath towels around him and where he got all the gunk and the grime and everything off of him. Young man, how would you like some new clothing? Jesus. And they brought out some clothes, just his size, and put him on it, put him into the clothes. He said, young man, are you hungry? Jesus. He was starting to get it. Jesus. And he sat down at this long table, and they brought him some delicious food to eat. And afterwards, boy, he had, he had filled his belly to the fill. And they said, young man, would you like some rest? Would you like to go to sleep? Would you like a nap? He said, Jesus. And they took him into this beautiful bedroom. They pulled down the satin sheets, put him inside, and put him there and let him go to sleep in peace. When I go to heaven, and if there is a door, would you like to come in? Jesus. Would you like to be completely remade? Jesus. How would you like to get every sin and every stain off of you? Jesus. How would you like to have a robe of righteousness? Jesus. How would you like to sit at the table and feast with the king? Jesus. How would you like to have rest forevermore? Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have not of this world, but of the next, you have everything. If you don't have Jesus, what you have in this world is make-believe. And what you have in the next is a horror when you go there. Today, you can have Jesus if you'll simply trust him as your personal savior. Let's pray.